Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, alongside me, once again, Mr. Martin Popoff. Greetings, my friend. How are you today? Thank you. I'm, I'm doing fine. Let's uh, let's talk some Legs Diamond. It's going to be fun. Yeah, so we, Martin and I are both fans of Legs Diamond, specifically, you know, those early albums, and we've gotten asked countless times by people over the last couple of months to please do a show on Legs Diamond. So Martin and I finally, you know, I brought the brought up the idea to him and he's like, oh, you know, like myself, really not all that familiar with the later, later catalog. And uh, so I, I think we both went and kind of dabbled in the later catalog and we came back and we're like, hey, you know what, man, it's a diff totally different band. Doesn't sound anything like the early albums. So we made a executive decision here just to rank the first three albums, yeah. which is the classic band. All right. Uh, we will we'll probably mention a little bit about some of the later albums, but we're just going to concentrate on those first three albums. And then there's a reason why, uh, which we'll get to as we're talking about them. So uh, I'm going to have Mark. So three, we're going to go from our least favorite of the, third, of the three to our favorite. I'm going to yeah. have Martin kick us off. We'll see if we're, we're totally in sync here. We're yeah. probably not going to be too much different because there's only three albums. Yeah, really, three. really. Uh, yeah. What, what, you know, what are the odds that the math is off, right? But anyways. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with the third one, uh, Firepower. And uh, as, as Pete was saying, I mean, basically, they broke up after this album. Um, you know, they broke up and reformed and came back like this is a 78 album. Um, they, they came back like six years later, and then they made these varyingly semi-atrocious, some are pretty good kind of hair metal -y albums. Very different band at that point. So, uh, so you could look at this as a band and even the guys in the band, like I've interviewed all these guys or most of them. And, and basically they say they do consider this the, the original band, even more so, not even this record. I mean, they, they almost even consider the first two records, which were on Mercury as the original band. So anyways, um, I'll say more later, but, uh, but to move on, Firepower. So this is their third and final album of that original run. It's on Cream Records. Um, so basically they had lost their deal with Mercury. They get on with this label. It's a label started by a pretty, a wealthy guy named Alan, Alan Bennett. And um, he kind of started the label to get his son going in the business, Wayne Bennett. And shortly thereafter, Wayne was shot and killed. And, uh, and basically Al Bennett was heartbroken and, and, and pretty much, um, you know, uh, wound down the label. So legs, unfortunately, it was everything was looking good for them. As the guys in the band say, I can't remember which one I was talking to, possibly Michael Diamond. He said that, you know, we get a young guy in here who likes our kind of music. Everything's going great. They had a lot of money. Um, but the other funny thing about this album. OK, so so very quickly, Love Underworld King. It's literally my favorite Legs Diamond song and possibly even the second favorite is Midnight Lady. But there's a lot of kind of poppy R&B stuff on here, which kind of goes away from what they did. And there's also three covers. And when I talked to the guys, it was because Cream, they were more like owners of music publishing. So they, they kind of wanted to use these songs that they own the rights to. Um, so there's a boxer cover, Mike Pato, More Than Meets the Eye. You've lost that love and feeling. I just hate that song. Uh, I don't want to hear anybody do that. Um, Help Wanted was a cover that they actually made a bit of a single for. Uh, this band was actually, um, you know, a little bit of a success in Texas, and that album, that that band was pretty good there. But uh, yeah, some other kind of heavy, sticksy sort of stuff, pump rock, um, and uh, Chicago, this kind of boogie woogie song. Um, so yeah, there you go. I mean, they they the band was kind of okay with this covers idea because they saw Van Halen was doing well with covers. They're an LA band as well, these guys. Um, so um, so they thought it was maybe a good idea, um, but yeah, just a, just kind of a big change in direction, loss of direction. Uh, there you go, firepower. Yeah, and I'm I'm in agreement there. Uh, that's my number three as well. Yeah, I mean, most of that heaviness and that real compelling nature of the first two albums are pretty much gone by this point. Couple too many covers. You said it perfectly there. Uh, I absolutely agree. Underworld King is a terrific song, and I don't know when I listen to that song, I hear like this kind of like mid seventies blue oyster cult feel a little bit to it. You know, it's got the, especially on the chorus, the guitar and keyboard interplay. It's got this kind of spooky vibe that BOC did quite a bit in the decade. Really great song. Uh, you got more than meets the eye. Pretty catchy. Got some good hooks. Nice guitar licks. Right. 
um chicago yeah chicago is like a really weird on this album because that like yeah. it sounds like a fog hat or like early ario Speedwagon, you know and it's just like why is like a boogie song in the middle of this album but then again this album is like all over the place right uh help wanted kind of decent kind of pompish reminds me of aviary a little bit uh tragedy is a decent enough song man at the top is is kind of proggy in spots right i think there's, there's maybe two or three songs on this album that kind of carry over a little bit of flavor from the first album but for the most part uh to me this is just it's it's solid it's enjoyable in spots but it's just all over the place it's it's just like uh a band that's just trying to figure out what the hell direction they're trying to go in after two really great first two albums um it, this is kind of like a disappointment but you know it's got it's got its uh, positive moments, I would say. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So my number two, I am going to go with the debut album, <clears throat> Legs Diamond. Um, so yeah, a little, little history on the band, I guess, is appropriate at this point. So, you know, I, I've, uh, I had this, this book series that's long sold out called Yield Metal. Actually, I still have the, the last one, Yield Metal 1979. But Basically, I wrote up the story of their second album and I wrote up the story of Firepower. So I tracked these guys down and interviewed them and stuff. So I, I was just reading a few things. So, so this band, LA band, they started in um, 1974. Um, you know, they had uh, Richie Blackmore would drop by to their rehearsals when they had, uh, they had, you know, the, the story was they had this great guitar player named Donovan McKitty. He was a black guy. He played, he, uh, the, the quote was he played a, like a cross between Jimi Hendrix and Richie Blackmore, but he got, um, he got sort of a disease that weakened him and he eventually had to uh, be out of the band. So um, Roger Romeo comes in, he's from Detroit. Uh, so he brings his Detroit influences to the band. And, um, and even Gene Simmons likes these guys. I mean, this song, this has a song called Satin Peacock on it, a really cool, awesome rocker. It's the one that goes, kiss me, but don't mess up my hair, right? Uh, and Gene Simmons asked the band if, uh, if they could use it for Kiss, and they said no to him. But, um, but yeah, so they're on Mercury Records with this. And, um, you know, essentially, uh, Cliff Bernstein from Mercury, uh, which was based in Chicago at the time, um, uh, got them, uh, yeah, I just, I just noticed this. So the Legs Diamond thing is, is the sort of the gangster image, right? There was a gangster from the 30s called Legs Diamond. Don't know if he was from Chicago, but I'm thinking there's the link to the Chicago uh, situation with uh, Mercury being in Chicago. And obviously we just talked about a song called Chicago, right? But they have this little gangster image thing going. And uh, obviously this is, uh, this is pretty interesting because it's, uh, they, they said that um, they liked the idea, but they were horrified that the guitar was not a type of guitar that they would ever play, but it's a guitar turned into a gun. And as we know, Ted Nugent kind of revived this idea. And even Roger Romeo, who just, just wrote me on Facebook when I posted this little, little long story comparing the album covers. Um, but he said that, uh, that he thought the Ted Nugent cover was a bit of a, a rip off of the lift of this. So Weekend Warriors, right? Ted's got a guitar on stage that's a gun. And here's a guitar that's a gun. And the funny thing is, um, this is like a Gibson Birdland look. And, and that's what Ted plays, right? Yep. So, uh, but, but cool album cover. I looked up this album cover artist. He's not the same guy that did the Ted and this guy actually didn't do too many different things, but so yeah, basically good, heavy album. Um, they're kind of like the, uh, America's deep purple, which was also said about, uh, angel. This is produced by Derek Lawrence, who actually also produced the first angel album. It's not the music stage, fright, Satin peacock. Yeah. These great heavy songs. There's some flute on here because Rick Sanford, the, the lead uh, vocalist uh, also plays flute, so that really doesn't doesn't fit on it. But great, great production on it, um, and uh, and yeah, just a, just a really good heavy um, America's Deep Purple sort of album. Maybe a little, maybe a little clinical. Maybe the songwriting is not really, really quite there. Um, oh, one one other funny story. Um, so the guys say they did not get along with Derek Lawrence at all. They said he was he was always like pretty drunk kind of thing and uh, and and basically they had uh, they had like twenty one of the guys said thirty songs that they played Derek and Derek basically picked the first seven or ten and said those are those are the songs that are going on your album they said wait wait we got more do you want to hear them all and they thought he was just kind of in it for just like let's get this thing done sort of thing 
So uh, they didn't have a great experience with Derek, but uh, but the record, you know, you can't you can't fault the results in terms of the production. This is a really good sounding album for for 1977. So there you go, first album, Lake Diamond. Yeah, um, I was kind of torn about uh, my number one and two here because I like them both almost equally. But yeah, in the long run, I I you know I went with uh, this also as my number two. And yeah, you know, America's Deep Purple. And again, you know, you got Derek Lawrence producing. There's another connection there, right? So I think this is a damn stellar debut. Uh, really, really good. A lot of really good songs. And uh, it's funny, it, you mentioned the story about how they had like 30 songs that they came to the sessions with and he just picked the first seven or eight. Well, I wonder how many of the rest of them made it to the second and third albums and how many were never, you know, never used. I mean, that's kind of when you think about it. Uh, stage fright, just a great slice of uh, U.S. hard rock for the times, right? I mean, this is '77, right? Uh, I'm hearing little, little riots, little yeah. heavy stars. You got the big hooks, the cowbell, all that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, it's just this is just really good, good American hard rock at a in a time where most people were talking about the British bands, right? But here you had like this undercurrent of, you know, bands like like Riot and Stars and Legs Diamond and Ted Nugent and whatnot, which were coming up and, you know, really starting to make some waves. Uh, Satin Peacock, great, great song. Uh, I think uh, Rick Sanford's vocals are really strong throughout this entire album. Uh, you got Rock and Roll Man, which has got that big Hammond organ, which again, kind of connects it to the Deep Purple sound, I think. Um, what else we got here? Deadly Dancer, great song. Rat Race, kind of a little bit of a little proggy going on in there. Uh, Can't Find Love. Can't Find Love almost to me sounds like uh, a long lost Tommy Boland solo track. It's got I thought of, it reminded me of Budgie, actually, you know, with that weird song title. And it's long yeah, a little bit too. Yeah, a little bit too. Yeah, it's got yeah. these you know big cool riffs. It's kind of slow and, and atmospheric, haunting keyboards. I don't know. I, I dig this album a lot. I, I I really struggled with the first two because they're both so, so good. And it just, the, the more you listen to these first two albums, you realize what kind of a drop off happened at the third. And then after that, right. Uh, it's just yeah. Yeah. really, really good quality in these first two records. Yeah. And I had additional notes. I had, that was quite proggy rock and roll man is very proggy and that one's got the flute in it. Um, but I, I love the, uh, you know, that you brought up riot because he does sound a lot like Guy Speranza, yeah. Michael Lee Smith. So he's got that good, you know, solid uh technically sound high voice little frank domino obviously there's all these uh associations with angel right because they're on the same management with angel toby management the first the first records produced by Derek lawrence angel had the first two Derek lawrence big jim sullivan legs diamond went on to eddie leonetti and so did angel angel went on to Letty, eddie leonetti with white hot and sinful and legs goes on to eddie with uh with the last one. So, um, so yeah, I, I also uh, on this first album, essentially almost all the songs are Michael Diamond, the bass player, uh, you know, he's taking the name Diamond, but his name is Gargano. Uh, and at one point the guys told me that, that they, they toyed with giving everybody the last name Diamond, but they said he's, he was kind of the leader of the band in the beginning um, and he sort of managed the band. Uh, but Michael Prince, the keyboard player, is also very prominent in this band. But yeah, so the first album, lots and lots of Michael Diamond uh, and uh, and Michael Prince. That was the other reason they didn't all call themselves Diamond, because they had two Michaels in the band, they said. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, and um, and so there you go. So, so those are the guys writing the song. So moving on to my number one, I went with A Diamond is a Hard Rock which is also 1977. So that's pretty amazing. They made two albums in 77 and, uh, or put out two albums in 77 and put out one in 78. Uh, I just recently did an episode of my, um, my History in Five Songs with Martin Popoff podcast, which is about the five heaviest US, five heaviest US metal albums, something like that, um, of the 70s. And I, I rated this number five, although uh, some of my uh, some of my faithful listeners have convinced me that I probably should have uh, had Aerosmith Rocks as my number five. And I'm, I'm almost inclined to agree. But this is a this is a good, heavy album for uh, for 1977 or for the 70s, obviously, uh, in total. And what you have happening here is Roger Romeo is now more part of the band. So there's a major shift in the writing to Roger. Um but really, it sounds very similar to the first one. I agree with you, Pete. I mean, they're, they're just so neck and neck, these ones, right? But uh, 
So you get, uh, the album is called A Diamond is a Hard Rock, which is a little stupid, but the song is called, also even more stupid, just Diamond is a Hard Rock. So there's no A on it, right? Um, but uh, yeah, great, great crunching hard rock song. Reminds me of Tease and Moxie to, uh, to put a Canadian twist on it. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is Eddie Leonetti and Lee DiCarlo, very important engineer uh, who worked with Eddie. Um, and they get a fantastic sound on it. It's a, it's a tiny bit less raw uh, than the first one, but the first one sounds great too. In fact, maybe the first one sounds better because it does have a little more bite. This really cleans up their sound and, and they are sounding a little aseptic. It's almost a little bit like when you put on your A&R hat, you might say that Riot Narita and this, the songwriting is not quite amazing, 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 right? Um, but everything else is really, really good. The performances, you can't beat it. I think I got it, super heavy one. Evil is a little Diablos in Musica, Devil's Tritone to that one total heavy metal and there's some good poppy hard rock on here and really nothing on it is uh, is particularly light at all it's all basically right. just a just a good heavy metal album with a with a nice perfect 1970s heavy metal logo up there right <laughs> so there you go there's my number one well my number one is also power of the night oops sorry i mean uh, <laughs> <Diamond> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah uh yeah i mean i echo everything martin just said this is uh this is a really fun heavy album really enjoyable lots of great melodies uh one thing uh that i do want to mention a couple tunes on here specifically woman i think uh kind of has that like hard rock meets prog meets pomp with the soaring vocals kind of like that mid-period sticks like you know maybe serpent is rising grand illusion type of thing yeah. uh pretty yeah. sophisticated i think and really good uh, you got you know jailbait good early metal gem again all these bands doing the kind of jailbait theme couldn't get away with that these days but back then you know whatever yeah. um what else we got uh great vocals and flute from uh rick on uh evil which i think is another terrific track uh live a little i think could have been or maybe should have been considered for a single because I think that's got some really good radio friendly hooks, but it still rocks quite a bit. And that kind of reminds me again, we mentioned, you know, stars and angel, maybe a little Piper early Ario Speedwagon, that sort of thing. Yeah. Just that really, really strong, like 70s uh, accessible hard rock sound, right? Uh, what else? Long Shot, another great song. Waiting, good moody rocker. Um, I don't know. I, I dig everything on this album. And like I said, I can't stress it enough. These two albums are seriously, seriously good. Kind of like long forgotten hard rock gems from the US scene uh, from the late seventies and stacks up pretty well with just about anything I think that was uh, released around the same time. Yeah. And, and to reiterate, I mean, we keep talking about Deep Purple obviously because there's the big John Lord Hammond sound that you get out of Michael Prince. And I thought Flying Too High on this had a little bit of that funky Aerosmith sort of thing. And that bleeds into, you know, three or four or five songs across this catalog and even into firepower because there's some clavinet on there. Uh, you know, they, they bleed into that idea that you mentioned perfectly, uh, the Tommy Boland thing, right? A as well as Stormbringer and as well as Burn. So there's a little bit of Mark III Deep Purple mixed in with, uh, with the heavy Mark II Deep Purple uh, in this band. And yeah, this is, this is the reason. Uh, oh yeah, I, I don't know if I mentioned this about Don, Donovan McKitty, that guy. Maybe I did, but so Richie Blackmore would actually come by and listen to these guys. And, and as, sort of a, as sort of a weird compl compliment to, to the guys, he would hear this Donovan, Donovan McKitty playing guitar and stuff. And Richie was always trying to buy his guitar off, apparently. So, <laughs> so anyways, so yeah, so, um, so just briefly, I mean, I don't know how much you want to say about this as well, but but again, to sort of rationalize why we didn't go on this, there's there's this out on out on the bail EP from '84 that I think gets expanded to a an LP in England, but it's got this horrible one of the worst snare drum sounds and drum sounds you could ever imagine on like like just a just a bad '80s mistake production value. So again, it it it. Uh, underscores the point that it's it's a way different band by the time they reform and come back in 1984 and that drum sound sticks out like a like a sore thumb yeah I mean, it's like the first thing you hear it's like okay this song oh what what is that yeah. i mean you know, and, and a couple of the songs aren't terrible but man the drum sound just absolutely ruins it for me anyway to my ears yeah here's a funny there's also a funny thing about the about the drum <laughs> situation right so i remember seeing this album and it's like okay this is obviously a heavy metal album 
But you know, my, we, we do have a keyboardist. So I thought, oh, that's a little bit of a negative. But I remember looking at this for the first time and seeing, ooh, the drummer, Jeff Poole. What is he doing holding a, holding a soft mallet, right? Like a timpani thing saying, is, this a, <laughs> is there some classical on this album? Is this a prog album? You know, so I, I I remember thinking that, but but no, I mean, as kids, I mean, this was just one of our one of our favorite of these B little B level baby bands because it was you know totally committed to the heavy metal cause for for 1977. But uh, but yeah, so they went on. Um, they did the Wish, Town Bad Girl, Town Bad Girl. What does that mean, right? Uh, Uncut Diamond, um, which is uh, which is like apparently uh, the early songs that they would have made after that for that third album, Firepower. And uh, I don't own it anymore, but I, I did have a um, like a like a four CD box set, I think it was, that had this unreleased shelved uh, later album. And uh, there's some pretty good stuff on there. Um, but uh, but yeah, essentially essentially the band is the first three albums. Yeah, it is. And I think uh, like Land of the Gun from 86, which was, uh, I believe, the next release after the Adam Bale, or maybe there was one in between. I don't remember. Some decent song ideas on that album, but it's it's so like mid 80s sounding. I mean, just way too many synths, uh, too many ballads and all the power of this band early on is just completely wiped away. Uh, And again, it's got the suspect lineup. Right. And it's just it just sounds like a band just kind of like, all right, we're back. We don't know what the hell we're doing here, um, yeah. really. And it seems like they've been kind of on that trajectory ever since the third album, unfortunately. It, and it's funny. There, there's a parallel there with Angel, which I have on my mind because I just finished yesterday my Angel book and I'm proofing it right now, right? But um, the, the funny thing is Angel never did come back in the 80s. And everybody said, what if? What if they would have come back? You know, good looking guys. They had this costume thing going that they probably would have got rid of. But you know, they, they, they were essentially a, a band that was already tr- transitioning into the hair metal idea anyways. Uh, MTV comes along, hair metal comes along. Angel might have been a huge band. So Legs Diamond kind of did what Angel didn't do. They did come back. And then they were just kind of like this uh, this poverty level version of hair metal and, and just kind of almost like ruined the reputation with these records. And on that 86 one, there's no Roger Romeo uh, or Michael Diamond. Uh, on him. I think the wiki is wrong on that as saying there is Roger on it, but, uh, you know, he, Roger's not there. Michael Diamond's not there. So key members of the band are not there. And, and yeah, it just, it's just this spotty weird catalog. Uh, apparently though, they're coming back with maybe, maybe another record again with this other lead singer. Um, Keith something, I believe, I think Roger in, in the Facebook post uh, yesterday mentioned, and he, and he put in a, a live clip. So, so they are still, uh, still kicking along and doing their thing. Um, but uh, yeah, what a, what a cool reputation they had set up with uh, with those early records. Yeah, absolutely. Man, your comment about Angel um, kind of participating in that mid late eighties hard rock and metal scene that's pretty intriguing when you think about it because they seem totally suitable for that era. It's almost like uh, and we talked about this with Stars and a couple other bands. Almost like Angel were like a little too late to the game or a little too early to the game, I should say. You fast forward all that about three four years and maybe Angel is enormous. Yeah. Hmm. For sure. Yeah. I'm telling uh, you. And this shows you how not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, everybody. There you have it. Your Legs Diamond episode. Uh, curious to see what everybody's thoughts are on this catalog, uh, how you rank those original albums. If you want to rank the whole catalog, go right ahead. What you think about the late catalog, that would be even more interesting. But I think uh, we can all agree that uh, at least two of those first three albums are top-notch classics so uh this is on the web at www.catranquility.org we're on facebook or on twitter of course we're here on youtube all the damn time martin you got uh, anything in the works uh podcast books all that kind of stuff what's next Not particularly uh my next episode of the podcast will be on imaginos and reimaginos that whole that whole crazy blue oyster cult story and uh yeah i'm just eagerly waiting for this huge shipment of books to arrive from the uk where i'll have my uh Thin Lizzy, a visual biography and a bunch of stuff I ran out of stock on. So fingers crossed I get that stuff uh, Monday or Tuesday, but it's like 800 pounds of books. It costs three Ooh. grand to send over here. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward because I, I, I seem to be the last guy who's never actually seen a copy of this Thin Lizzy coffee table book. So there you go. <laughs> so remember, everybody, go to Martin, uh, www.martinpopoff.com. You can check out all of Martin's stock on his books and uh, order some up. He will uh, 
hand sign them all for you. So with a nice little note as he always does. So uh, please go ahead and check out his website and we'll see you all uh, this weekend. We got more stuff coming up tomorrow. So uh, Jack Toledano coming back on the show for a ranking the albums of ice earth, Rich Catino coming back on the show for a ranking the albums of Evergrey. So that's happening tomorrow. You don't want to miss it. And uh, we'll probably see Martin next week. So take care, everybody have a good weekend and I'll see you soon. <laughs>